Good morning and welcome to my second lecture uh, for the course Partition of India in Print, Media and Cinema. Uh, I am Dr. Sharbani Banerjee from the Department of Humanities and Social Sciences, IIT Roorkee. So, uh, for the first class, we talked about the moderates uh, and the extremists and uh, now for today's lecture, we are going to discuss the different British policies that added up to and led to the partition, the cracking of the subcontinent. So, first we are going to talk about Morley Minto reforms. The Government of India Act in 1909, which is also known uh, as the Indian Councils Act, it was famously known as the Morley Minto reforms and it was named after the two British officials, Lord Minto and Lord John Morley, who were the Viceroy and the Secretary of State of British India respectively during the period between 1905 and 1910. So, why this reform? We are going to take a look at the background also. 20th century India saw increased vocality of with the formation of INC. Uh, we see that towards the end of uh, 19th century and at the beginning of 20th century, there were vociferous protests uh, that, that uh, were resulting from the Indians exposure to uh, western education and they are becoming conscious about the unfairness that the uh, British policies already uh, had and so there were uh, demands at different levels, right. The different leaders of INC were demanding for political agency through representation of the Indians in the government. That was the central demand. While the extremists engaged in undermining of the British laws, uh, which caused the death of both the British and the Indians through such uh, violent physical confrontation. Uh, and this was certainly something that the rulers, the Raj was looking to avoid. And so, uh, as a way of uh, uh, avoiding confrontation, the British were uh, willing to, uh, you know, willing to engage with, to uh, agree to some of the demands made by the moderates and they were prepared to uh, provide certain concessions which came in the form of Morley Minto reform. They were acquiescing basically to some of the demands made by the moderates as a way of escaping or avoiding the confrontation with the extremists. So, we see that although Queen Victoria had proclaimed that all Indians be treated equally, this was hardly translated into reality as the British authorities were uh, in, in practice, they were not ready to espouse the Indians, the colonized as equal to themselves. Only a few extremely elite and educated Indian could avail and enjoy such opportunity of being an equal to the colonizer. So, Lord Curzon we already talked about the 1905 partition of Bengal, which was a premonition and at that time uh, uh, at least the upper echelons uh, from uh, different parts of Indian society uh, could already uh, imagine that in a few decades time, the country is going to be uh, partitioned beyond uh, any redemption. It would be a permanent process, the dismembering of the subcontinent. So, uh, 1905 was a first step towards that. Lord Curzon had carried it out. It had led to a massive uprising in Bengal and consequently the British authorities realized the need for some reforms at the level of governance. Hence, more limited reforms were uh, proposed. The Indian National Congress was actively uh, demonstrating for more reforms and self-governance of Indians. While the earlier Congress leaders were moderates who believed in non-violent methods, afterwards we see that the extremist leaders were on the rise 
and they were resorting to more aggressive means. The INC demanded home rule for the first time in 1906. Gopal Krishna Gokhale met Lord John Morley in England to emphasize the needs for reforms. And then in uh, Shimla deputation, we see an, a group of elite Muslims uh, led by Aga Khan met Lord Minto in uh, 1906 and they placed their demand for a separate electorate for the Muslims. So, it is with the Morley Minto reform that we will see that the question of separate electorate arises for the first time. John Morley was a member of the liberal government and he wanted to make positive changes in India's governance. In the light of increasing extremism, the moderates set forth se certain demands before the British government and as a way of placating these demands, more limited reform was introduced. This act was responsible for creating executive councils in the provinces of Bombay, Madras and Bengal and it introduced separate electorates for the Muslims. So, the question of like I said a separate communal identity comes from here and a lot of critics such as Asha Jalal see this as the first uh, you know perception of a divided existence being sown inside the head of the Indians. So, they do not remain Indians, but they go on to become a Muslim Indian or a Hindu Indian for the first time. The self perception actually changes with such reforms. Legislative councils of Bengal, Madras, Bombay and United provinces would have 50 members each. Legislative councils of Punjab, Burma and Assam would have 30 members each. And as a result of this reform, the number of additional members of the Central Legislative Council was increased from 16 to 60. The legislative councils at the center and at the provinces consisted of four categories of members. A, the ex officio members, which was which it comprised the governor general and members of executive council. Then the nominated official members. It comprised government officials who were nominated by governor general. Then the third category would be nominated non-official members. It comprised uh, members nominated by governor general, but those who were not government officials. And finally, the elected members, those who were elected by different categories of Indians. Right? The principle of election to the councils was legally recognized. So, the councils were given the right to discuss and pass resolutions on the budget and on all matters of public interest. An Indian member Satyendra Sinha was appointed as the Indian member of the Viceroy's Executive Council. In Bombay and Madras, the number of members of executive councils was raised from 2 to 4. So, we see that Monumento reforms is doing two things, it is increasing the representations of Indian Indians in general, but also dividing Indians in terms of smaller identities. And this actually will become more uh, magnified with the, the policies that follow. Two Indians uh, were also appointed to the Indian Council that assisted the Secretary of State for Indian Affairs. They were KC Gupta and Syed Hussein Bilgrami, both of whom were civil servants. So, we see uh, political agency by the Indians, Indians that were informed, right? educated and informed Indians. The members were elected indirectly under this reforms, under these reforms. The local bodies would elect an electoral college that was responsible for electing the members of the provincial legislative councils. Next representations of the central legislative council would be elected in turn by the members of the provincial legislative councils. These elected members were from the local bodies, the chambers of commerce, landlords, universities, 
traders communities and Muslims. So, we see that all these divisions in identities different electorates would later be formed. So, we see all these uh, minor and fine uh, divisive lines emerging and of course, the separate identity of the Muslim as a community. As a result of the Morlimento reforms, the Indians were given membership to the Imperial Legislative Council for the first time. Although several non-official members were nominated, a non-elected majority was still assured. The reforms uh, never intended to establish a parliamentary form of government in India. Nevertheless, the establishment of the electoral concept for the legislative council set the foundations of such a parliamentary form. So, we see that as a result of the Morlimento reform, the issue of a separate electorate becomes a major issue of concern uh, and it is the first step. Now, that the Muslims have been able to push their demand for a separate electorates, other populations, other communities such as the Sikhs, the Anglo Indians also start to demand it. So, the fissures become deeper and deeper and this is the first step towards it. This act could be seen as introducing representative government, government in terms of one's communal belonging. And so, it was instrumental in creating like I have already stated creating a fissure along religious line which ultimately led to a widening of gaps between the different communities and problems beyond resolution. The act had increased the number of elected members in the imperial legislative council and provincial legislative councils, but, but most members were still indirectly elected. The apparent purpose of Morlimento reforms was to divide the nationalist groups. Natives were gaining representation, but also divisive representation. It was creating communal disharmony between especially two major groups, the Hindus and the Muslims and that is where this dyadic relationship that never went away from the South Asian context emerged for the first time. right? So, the act introduced communal representation in Indian politics. This was intended to stem the upsurge of nationalism in the country. So, if the Indians were actually fighting towards a unified goal, uh, a single goal, it would be much more strengthened, much more amplified uh, and it, it could be achieved uh, sooner. Uh, the, the degree of success would be uh, astounding. So, it was important to divide and rule, uh, something that I had mentioned at the outset, at the beginning of my lecture 1. So, dividing the Indian people was very important into communal lines. The culmination of this policy was seen in the partition of the country along religious lines. The effects of differential treatment of different religious groups, has, it still has its repercussion. So, the, 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 these reforms that were made at the turn of 20th century keeps back to haunt the South Asian post-colonial nations even till date. It is very much visible and present in the current politics of South Asia. Although the act was responsible for increasing Indian participation in the legislative councils, especially in the provincial councils, councils it did not in reality grant colonial self-government, which Congress was originally demanding. So, it increased representation without really offering or granting self-rule. So, uh, after we have talked about the drawbacks of the Morlimento reforms, we will next move to uh, World War I and uh, the Lucknow Pact, the period being between 1914 and 1918. So, with the commencement of the World War I in 1914, a scenario of complete chaos and disorder and it called for uh, bold moves and novel experiments. So, Lord Schlemsford, who was the Viceroy of India at that time, sought for uh, 
reform recommendations. He sought uh, recommendations from Indians regarding how reformations can be brought about. In exchange, Schlemsford uh, wanted the Indian people and the political parties to support Britain in the war. Uh, put more simply, they would ref bring uh, reformations in Indian administrative policies and in exchange the Indians would have to fight for Britain in the war. That was the deal that Lord Schlemsford uh, was trying to make uh, as a viceroy with the, uh, with the Indian leaders, nationalist leaders. This of course entailed making certain compromises in the shape of constitutional revisions that Schlemsford was agreeing, was uh, agreeing to uh, consider at that point in order to win Indian support. The Indian nationalists were increasingly demanding self-government. They wanted to exploit this uh, opportunity, saw the need of working together in resistance of British authority. If we see around the same period, India's political situation saw a number of important developments. For example, uh, uh, Maratha leader and uh, an extremist, Bal Gangadhar Tilak was freed in 1914 after serving six years uh, in the prison. Bal Gangadhar Tilak was uh, imprisoned for six years in Mandalay, Burma after his conviction uh, in a sedition case in 1908. And he, after he was uh, released, he was readmitted to Congress uh, in the following year. Uh, so, we see that in 1907, there was a British split in Congress in, uh, between the extremists and the moderates, but such split was suspended for the time being. Because of his confinement, Tilak had become an even more popular and respected Congress leader and he had made his comeback to INC. His conviction was that the Hindu Muslim unity was the foundational condition for the progress of India's dream of Swaraj. Just hearkening back his famous, uh, uh, you know, famous statement that Swaraj is my birthright and I will have it. So, uh, th this was the only way of strengthening the dream and the idea of Swaraj. Through only through Hindu Muslim unity could Swaraj be achieved. And he had realized this to while, while spending time in the prison. Tilak also came to the conclusion that British's uh, extensive engagement in the World War I had given a fresh window of opportunity for uh, uh, self-rule constitutional reforms. So, Lucknow Pact, if we look at a glance what Lucknow Pact, Pact was about, it was an agreement made in uh, December 19. 16 uh, by the Indian National Congress that was headed by Maratha leader Bal Gangadhar Tilak and all Indian and, and the all Indian uh, Muslim League uh, led by Muhammad Ali Jinnah. So, it was adopted by the Congress at its Lucknow session on December 29th and by the League on December 31st, 1916. The meeting at Lucknow uh, marked the reunion of the moderate and the radical wings of the Congress, like we have already uh, uh, we have already discussed in the earlier slide. For the time being, the split that had earlier happened in 1907 in Surat between the extremists and the moderates was suspended. They were working to a, together towards a common goal now, which is home rule. So the meeting uh, at uh, Lucknow marked the union of the moderate and the radical wings of the Congress and the pact uh, dealt both with the structure of the government of India as well as with the, the relation of the Hindu and the Muslim communities. Muhammad Ali Jinnah became a member of the Muslim League in 1913. Earlier, he was one of the leaders uh, among uh, other uh, Muslim leaders such as uh, Aga Khan III, uh, Khwaja Salim Ulala, uh, Khwaja Salimullah, uh, Hakim Ajmal Khan, Wakarul Mulk, uh, who all contributed to the foundation of uh, Muslim League in 1913. 
1906 in Dhaka, Bangladesh, right? Uh, Dhaka, which is now a part of Bangladesh. So, uh, we see that uh, uh, M. A. Jinnah became a member of the Muslim League only in 1913. Uh, he had been a member of the con Congress and he continued to remain a member of the Congress. In fact, he stressed uh, famously that league membership was a second priority to him and his, uh, is his main focus was the greater national cause of an independent India. So, till that time we see that uh, Jinnah's uh, priority is independence of India, the anti-colonial struggles that he, he was a leader in these movements and his communal identity uh, took a back seat at that time. So, he was regarded in fact highly by both the Congress and the Muslim League and was dubbed as an ambassador of Hindu Muslim reconciliation. Tilak and Jinnah had already collaborated throughout the previous decade which facilitated the process of uh, pushing for constitutional reforms on a Hindu Muslim platform. So, we see that Tilak and Jinnah were uh, collaborating towards uh, uh, the single goal of achieving self governance. So, despite the fact that uh, at that time uh, the elected president of the Congress session was uh, someone called Ambika Charan Mazumdar, Tilak was the driving force behind the Muslim League alliance. Tilak and Jinnah were both members of the Home Rule League and this Home Rule League had another very uh, important and uh, you know uh, a very influential figure uh, in it. Uh, it was formed by someone called Annie Besant. Annie Besant was an Irish socialist who declared that England's need is India's opportunity. So, she was actually goading the Indians to use the situation, the emergency situation uh, entailed by World War I, get the best out of it. So, while Tilak launched the Indian Home Rule League in April 1916 at Belgaum, uh, Annie Besant launched the Home Rule League in 1916 at Madras. They had this common objective of achieving self-governance self in India. At the meeting in Bombay, the extremists and the moderates met with the Muslim League officials and this was the first combined meeting of the INC and the Muslim League during which both parties agreed on a list of constitutional amendments and a strategy for moving forward. So, we see that in October 1916, 19 elected Indian members of the Imperial Legislative Council were sent, they sent the Viceroy a petition and requested for a number of changes. Uh, following negotiations in November 1916, both the Indian National Congress and the Muslim League confirmed the agreement in their respective council sessions in Lucknow in December 1916. And the pact that was signed, the, the agreement at, was later known as the Lucknow Pact. Sarojini Naidu uh, bestowed upon Jinnah the title of ambassador of Hindu Muslim uh, unification uh, as a way of recognizing his efforts. However, this was later understood as a very short sighted remark. Although the Lucknow Pact uh, offered the appearance of uh, Hindu Muslim uh, unity in the national political landscape, it was only a very short lived and in fact a very uh, flimsy illusion. So, we see that at the time when uh, Lucknow Pact is signed, uh, the government began to communalize the Indian matters, particularly the question of representation, demonstrating that Hindus and Muslims in India are two distinct people that have very separate needs. Uh, 
However, this alliance was beneficial to the Muslim League. Since uh, the Lucknow Pact served as a face for Muslim masses, despite the fact that it did not have uh, any consolidated Muslim base or Muslim following at that point. The pact's main achievement was that the Congress and the Muslim League had agreed on separate representation for Muslims in uh, imperial and provincial legislatures where they were in the minority which gave more weight uh, to the Muslims than their population would merit. So, by the same logic, uh, the pact raised the non-Muslim participation while decreasing Muslim representation in Muslim majority provinces such as Punjab and Bengal. As a, as a result of this treaty, the Muslims were given one third of the imperial uh, legislative council seats. The Muslims parliamentary representation was decreased to 40 percent in Bengal, while they made up to 52.6 percent uh, of the population. In the same way, the par parliamentary participation was limited to 50 percent in Punjab, whereas uh, they would make in Punjab, they made up 54.8 percent of the population. So, the deal granted the Muslims uh, privileges in provincial legislatures in Muslim majority provinces. Muslims, uh, for example, made only 10.5 percent of the population in Bihar uh, and Odisha, but received 25 percent of the legislative uh, seats. In Bombay, they made up 20.4 percent of the population, but received 33.3 percent of the legislative seats. Their population share in the central province was 4.3 percent. However, they received 15 percent of parliamentary seats. Further, they made up 6.5 percent of the population of Madras, but 15 percent of the parliamentary seats. Their population share in the United Provinces, which is today's Uttar Pradesh was 14 percent, but they received 30 percent of the legislative uh, seats. So, the ideas where we can see these ideas were an improvement on Gokhale's political testament on the first count. So, half of the executive council members which included those of the central legislative uh, central executive council were to be Indians elected by the councils themselves and four fifths of the provincial and central legislatures were to be elected on a broad franchisee. Except for the provision of provision for the central executive, the government of India act 1919 fully contained all these suggestions. In all provinces except Punjab and Bengal, where they yielded some ground to the Hindu and Sikh minority, the Congress consented to separate electorate for Muslims. So, this is something that is that becomes you know a permanent part of these policies a major clause and this never goes away a separate identity for the Muslims and then we understand and this is the beginning for the league to afterwards claim in the ensuing decades that the Muslim are a separate nation and so from here emerges the two nation theory. The seed of sectarianism is sown at this level. Separate electorates for Muslims in provincial council elections and weightage in their favor, weightage beyond the proportion suggested by the population. So, the weightage and the population uh, of the Muslims would not always, uh, you know, correspond, they would not be, there would be no correspondence between the two. This agreement set the path for the Hindu Muslim collaboration in uh, M. K. Gandhi's non-cooperation movement from 1920. So, uh, offering a separate electorate to the Muslims were initially seen uh, 
as uh, a way of including uh, or, or, or it was a way of tying the different communities towards a common goal such as their participation in a very important movement M K Gandhi's non-cooperation movement uh, from 1920, but later on it would also be used for divisive aims. right? So, with this uh, we come to the conclusion of our second lecture uh, and I will meet you again for our third lecture. Thank you so much.